So the text we'll be reading today comes from Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 23. Listen to the word of God. Now when Jesus heard that John was arrested, he went to Galilee. He left Nazareth and settled in Capernaum, which lies alongside the sea in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. This fulfilled what Isaiah the prophet said, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, alongside the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who lived in the dark have seen a great light, and a light has come upon those who lived in the region and in shadow of death. From that time, Jesus began to announce, change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. As Jesus walked alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea, because they were fishermen. Come, follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away, they left their nets <clears throat> and followed him. Continuing on, he saw another set of brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, repairing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. He announced the good news of the kingdom and healed every disease and sickness among the people. This is the word of God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> exactly six years ago, when I was a sophomore at Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, I was in my final week of a J-term in internship at a church down in Florida. As the culmination of my work there that week, month, I got to preach the sermon that Sunday. It was my very first time ever preaching. The text assigned to that week in the Revised Common Lectionary, which is a three-year cycle of texts a lot of churches use when choosing their readings every week, was the story of the call of disciples from Matthew 4, which you may have just recognized. At the time, I preached something about following God's call even when you're not sure where it's going to lead. I figured that my experience as a pastor's kid moving every three to five years growing up gave me a pretty good idea of what this following business looked like. But that was only the beginning. Here I am, six years later, almost to the day, and I'm preaching on that same exact text from Matthew. The lectionary cycle just happened to line up that way, and I'll take that as a sign that my own story has something to do with this text. In this text, Jesus approaches two sets of brothers along the Sea of Galilee. First, he comes to Simon and Andrew, who are busily casting their fishing nets into the sea. Both of them are fishermen, so this is something they've done for hours every day, days at a time, and months and years on end. They cast their nets, wait for fish, pull the fish in, collect the fish, cast the nets out, repeat, repeat, sometimes mend the nets, repeat some more. It's something that they've done for a long time, and they could probably do while half asleep. But this ordinary day is about to get turned upside down. Because along comes Jesus. As we read earlier in the text, he's new to the area. When he heard about John the Baptist's recent arrest, he left his home in Nazareth and has just settled in Capernaum on the, city of Galilee, on the Sea of Galilee. Therefore, it is unlikely that Simon and Andrew, who are from Capernaum, have ever met or seen him before this moment. In spite of this, though, Jesus approaches them and, out of nowhere, calls out to them. Come, follow me, Jesus says, and I'll show you how to fish for people. I don't know about you, but if someone I didn't know came up to me with such an odd proposition, I would most likely turn the other way and pretend I hadn't heard. Fish for people? Why? What does that even mean? Also, who are you and why are you talking to me? But that's not what happens at all. Instead of politely declining or rudely declining this offer, and instead of asking some clarifying questions before getting off the boat, Simon and Andrew drop everything and follow Jesus. 
immediately, no questions asked. It's truly miraculous. One could argue that this is Jesus' very first miracle, especially in the Gospel of Matthew. But I, for one, still have some questions. Why did they follow so quickly? Was it something Jesus said? Or was it something about Jesus himself that was so irresistible? Or was it something else? I've been doing a lot of thinking about these questions, and here's what I think. I think that they followed because they felt something in that moment that they had never felt before. In the version of this story that appears in John, Jesus gives Simon a new name, Peter, the instant he meets him. Even though this renaming does not happen explicitly in Matthew's version of the event, I think it helps to explain what's happening. At the beginning of the story, Simon and Andrew know who they are. They're Simon and Andrew, two fishermen. It is a fine identity, and they're relatively content in their routines and labor. But Jesus' brief invitation to them changes everything. He offers them the chance to be something other than fishermen, the chance to be fishers for people, the chance to be disciples. For Simon, this also involved a new name, Peter. But even for Andrew, this moment was the beginning of his own new identity. I believe that this invitation, this call, was transformative. These few brief words opened Simon and Andrew's eyes to see a whole new life, a life in which they were no longer fishermen, but something more. It's not that being a fisherman was a bad thing or that they didn't like it, but this new call offered them an identity that fit them better than any they could have ever imagined. It pulled together their life experiences in a way that spoke to them in their inmost being. Deep inside, they knew immediately that this was right. This was who they were, and there was no use in resisting it because it was exactly what they were meant to be. Now, I can't say that I've had a call experience quite this dramatic, although I know some people have, but I have felt that pull inside of me that told me who I was so powerfully that I just knew it was right. I've had this experience twice, actually. The first time was the summer after I graduated from college. My husband and I were out to dinner with his parents at a restaurant in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We were both already enrolled at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, which we're, we would be starting in September. During dinner that night, I was talking about how I've always loved teaching, but could never decide on what kind of teacher I would like to be. I've always loved school and basically always wanted to teach whatever grade I was in at the time, up to and including college, which by the end of it left me with way too many options even before I chose a subject. So. Up to that point, I would kind of assumed I would eventually fall into some kind of teaching position, but I had no idea what that might be. That night, though, one offhand comment from my mother-in-law opened my eyes to a whole new vision of my life. As a music teacher, my mother-in-law has an insider view of the school system, and she mentioned that because of the growing immigrant population, there's a high demand for English as a second language teachers. As soon as she said this, something clicked inside of me. I had never considered teaching ESL before, probably because it wasn't a class I had ever taken in my own schooling. But now that this idea was in front of me, I knew it was where I had to go. Everything about it fit. My enjoyment of grammar, my preference for small group teaching, my own experiences learning other languages, and the sense that I'd be making such a huge difference in these students' lives. And as a bonus, the ESL teaching license in Minnesota is K through 12, so there's a wide age range for me to work with. There was just one problem. I didn't have a teaching degree. And in fact, I was about to embark on a three-year seminary education that would also not get me a teaching degree. Not that I wasn't also excited about seminary, but an outsider looking at my current um, degree program versus my intended career would probably think I was crazy. But something about seminary was too enticing for me to change my plans. Even besides the logistics of what it would look like to try to withdraw from one program and apply for another. I could feel myself being drawn to seminary by the promise of growing closer to God and learning more about my faith. 
which, by the way, is a perfectly good reason to go to seminary. In my experience, it was more than worth it. So I went on to seminary, trusting God that my time spent there would be worth it in terms of personal growth, even if it didn't really have anything to do with my intended career. But then, as I was nearing the end of my first year there, I began to feel that deep pull inside me again. People around me kept telling me that my call to teaching sounded like a deacon's work. I would brush off these comments, not really knowing what a deacon was and not wanting the pressure of anything having to do with ordination. During college, I had begun the candidacy process as an inquirer, but had dropped out when, I, when it became clear to me that I didn't really have the passions or skills to be an elder. So ever since that time, I have been very adamant in my belief that I was going to remain a layperson, even if I was a seminary-educated layperson. But the comments kept coming from multiple people, including Dr. Margaret Ann Crane, who, if you know anything about the United Methodist Order of Deacons, she is like the expert in the entire church. So it got harder and harder for me to ignore this feeling that maybe they were all right and I was wrong. And the more I learned about deacons, the more my gut would tell me, this is who I am, a deacon. I'm still not ordained or even commissioned yet, but my own identity has already changed. I now see myself as living out the call of deacon, someone who is called to bridge the church and the world, someone who is called to preach and teach God's word and who works to lead and equip other Christians to use their own gifts as they love and serve those around them and someone who has a special eye out for where the compassion of the church can bring justice into the world. My own particular call to deacon is through this ESL teaching and being a bridge between the immigrant community and the church community. So as I was learning about the ministry of deacons, this identity of deacon branded itself upon me and onto what I had previously seen as my calling to become an ESL teacher. Now, these two identities, deacon and ESL teacher, have, become, have come together inside of me so powerfully that I can no longer see myself any differently, even though I haven't technically become either of those yet. Now that I'm done with seminary, I'm taking the final step towards living out my call. I'm currently working on my ESL teaching, lessons, er, teaching license through the university here in Mankato. By 2015, I should be both receiving my teaching license and getting commissioned as a deacon in the United Methodist Church. Thanks be to God. This change in my self-awareness and identity also changed how the world around me looked. With this call, I have direction. With this call, I can see more clearly how my life relates to those around me. With this call, my whole life is grounded in a relationship with God, my creator. My own experiences of feeling God call me and essentially rename me first as ESL teacher and then as deacon ESL teacher were incredibly transformative. And I believe that Peter and Andrew felt this too. Their brief interaction with Jesus alongside the Sea of Galilee radically changed how they saw the world. Before, the only part of the world that concerned them was their own city of Capernaum and specifically the area along the lake shore. But now, Jesus invites them to see the world as God sees it, large, diverse, and full of potential. Jesus calls them to leave the lake shore behind and journey with him into the unknown. The unknown is always a little bit scary, or at least uncomfortable. But Peter and Andrew follow willingly. Why? Because what they don't know the details of where they'll be going or what they'll be doing is vastly outweighed by what they do know. And what they do know is this, that miraculously, this man Jesus knows them better than they know themselves and is offering to lead them forward into the life they were really meant to live. Jesus is offering them a new life grounded in the transformational power of a relationship with him. We can also see this reflected in the core of Jesus' message that he has just begun to preach. Change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of God. This is not a passive message. Jesus is preaching a message of transformation. 
not only is our world being transformed with God's kingdom breaking in here on earth as it is in heaven, but we too can be transformed through our relationship with God. God is offering us that same transformative call that Jesus gave to the disciples by the lake shore. Come, follow me. Come with me, and I will show you who you were truly meant to be. Last week, Fred talked about what it's like to hear God's voice. When God speak to, speaks to us, it is weighty. God speaks with authority. Like Fred said, God is the author of our life, so God's voice is like none other. This weightiness, this authority, is what I was feeling inside of me, those times when I felt God's call showing me who I am. Jesus spoke with that same authority when he called Peter and Andrew away from their boat, leading them forward into a life of ministry together with him. Whether they heard it in his words, in his voice, or whether they, like me, felt it in their gut, they could tell that Jesus was speaking with more than just a human voice. He was speaking with the voice of God. And when you can hear that it's God's voice that is calling you, it's not a call you can resist. Oh, but we try to resist. I think Peter and Andrew's story still sounds a little too neat and tidy for most of us with our messy and complicated lives. After all, they did have Jesus Christ in the flesh standing in front of them. For the rest of us, even when we hear the voice of God, we try to resist. As I mentioned in my own story, for a long time I adamantly refused to believe I was called to the order of deacon. It was not the future I had planned or the future I wanted, so I did my best to push it aside. I met lots of people at seminary who had felt calls to ministry years and years earlier, but kept pushing God aside and taking their lives in other directions. But try as we might, we could not resist forever. I gave in after a few months while some of my friends waited decades, but God's call did not stop or weaken in that time. It only grew stronger. Because God knows us better than we know ourselves. God knows us from our days in the womb. God knows us throughout our lives. And God knows our thoughts and feelings before we even sense them ourselves. So when God speaks to you, whether it's inside your heart or through the mouths of others, it's to you with all your quirks, all your questions, all your skills, and all your experiences already taken into account. And the name that God calls you, or the call God invites you into, will fit you better than you could have ever chosen on your own. In some cases, your call will be to a particular job or career path, but that is not always true. Just like God is too big to be ever fully described in human language, God's call on our lives is too personal and too nuanced to ever fit into human categories of vocation. Each person's call is uniquely different, tailored specifically to that person's interests and skills and experiences. I've already told you about my call to be a deacon ESL teacher. Peter and Andrew were called to be Jesus' disciples, spreading the message of God. Your call is as personal as you are. Some are called to parenting, some to other forms of caregiving and friendship, some to community leadership, some to artistic expression, some to research and discovery. The list goes on and on, with all of our different calls coming together to create an infinitely complex and wonderfully beautiful tapestry. It is through the interweaving of all of these amazing calls that the kingdom of God comes to life here on earth. The reason our calls are so irresistible when we hear them is that they offer us an opportunity like none other. Not only do they show us who we were meant to be, but they give us the chance to ourselves be a part of God's work in the world. No work could be more meaningful than actually getting to participate in the coming of the kingdom of God. Talk about making a difference that will last. But not only can we participate in this amazing work and experience God's power firsthand, we each get to participate in our very own special way, as if we're each a puzzle piece that no other piece can replace. This is the good news of the passage from Matthew. Jesus is calling every single one of us into a new life that is more meaningful 
and more amazing than we can imagine. It's not a cookie cutter life. It will look different for each one of us. But what we all have in common is that Jesus is the one calling and that God will be with us every step of the way. If you already know you've heard Jesus call in your life, I'm so glad. You may already be on that journey with Jesus into new life. Or you may be hesitant, not yet ready to take that leap out of what you're used to and into the unknown. This reaction is natural and understandable. However, playing it safe limits our possibilities. We won't get to experience the fullness of what the Holy Spirit can work in and through us until we take that step of faith. Others of you may never have felt this call or may have no idea what kind of calling God has for you. But this passage has some more good news. It's not up to us. In the story, Jesus is the initiator. In fact, the disciples don't say anything at all. Jesus says to them, come, follow me, and they come. And it's the same for each of us. Jesus is calling us into new and amazing lives of transformation. His call is continuous and patient, waiting until we hear it and respond. Often we don't realize our own calls without the help from others. While God sometimes speaks directly to our hearts, many times we hear the voice of God through the observations of those who are close to us. Through prayer, study, and Christian community, we can come closer to understanding who God has called us to be. Whether you have heard the call, aren't sure if you've heard it, or know you haven't heard it, take heart. Just like the calls themselves are each totally unique, so is the timing. We can't predict how or when Jesus will come to us with this call, but we can trust that we are called. This is the promise we receive in baptism, as we are initiated into God's family and marked with a seal. All Christians are called to the work of bringing forth the kingdom of God, to love God with our whole being, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We are all called to bring good news to the poor, justice to the oppressed, sight to the blind, and food to the hungry. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. If you're not yet sure what your own specific call is, rest assured that if this is your path, you are already following Jesus. You may not have heard the entirety of Jesus' call yet, but God's transformation in your life has already begun. And when you do hear the call, it may not make for a radical change in your daily life, although it may. When Jesus calls us, it opens up the possibility for a deeper relationship with God, which in turn lets us see the world around us with new eyes. Our previous life is not tossed aside in the change, but it is transformed. We begin to see how every step we've taken up to this point has formed us into who we are, into this unique person whom Jesus is calling with our own special name. Six years ago, when I was preaching on this same text, I had absolutely no idea that I would be doing it again today. By that point in my internship, I had discerned that I was probably not meant to be a pastor. And yet, as I stand here today, that part of my journey was invaluable. That internship and the many other experiences that I've had leading up to now have all formed me into a person who does know her calling. It was not at all what I expected, but that feeling in my gut comes back to me every time I stop to think about what I'm doing. This is right. And the peace and joy that come with that feeling are indescribable. So while it's true that I did know something about the business of following Jesus back when I preached my first sermon, there was so much more waiting for me that I could not have imagined. And I think I've learned enough about God in the process to know that I can't predict what the next step of the call will look like either. But I do know this, it will be right. So let us all listen anew for God's voice as we await and rejoice in the call on our lives. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the call you have given each one of us. 
We praise you for seeing promise and potential in us that we cannot see ourselves. Forgive us for the fears and excuses that have kept us from following you. We do not always hear your voice, but make yourself known to us so that we might discover and live into the amazing call you have in mind for us. Thank you so much for the grace you've given us in Jesus Christ and for the chance to participate in the transformation of the world. May we all come to know the joy of an ever deepening relationship with you. In the holy and wonderful name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen.